Elvin, what is your take on the UN climate uh, change negotiations in Doha? Could smallholder agriculture have been included in a better way there? You know, it's it's really hard to know how to respond to that question uh, as a professional working on these issues. Um, I'm really torn between uh, talking up the process uh, because the process is quite weak and needs that kind of positive talk to keep people uh, focused, to keep energy, to keep the belief that this system can somehow deliver. I'm torn between that and 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 the sort of the science of this, which is that we are moving woefully slowly, and um, there doesn't seem to be enough political will in the system right now to to generate the kind of action that's needed. Um, so you know, it, it's either the glass half full or the glass half empty. The glass half full is that the process continues. Uh, there wasn't a breakdown in the talks. Um, there is a uh, there were some agreements, for example, there was a, you know, a Kyoto Protocol uh, continues to survive in, 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 in a form. Um, there were some agreements on, uh, you know, how the negotiation process will, will, will proceed. The glass half empty is that um, we've got very little time left now to start peaking our emissions and start decreasing them. And we're on completely the wrong trajectory. And it doesn't feel like there's enough political will there. So if you ask me what this, how do I feel about this conference from the perspective of smallholder farmers, you know, the world is, is woefully, woefully short of what kind of action is needed at the international level to create a framework to avoid dangerous climate change. And it's smallholder farmers that unfortunately are going to be on the front line of that. So they went in the conference, they went in the rooms, um, but you know, their spirits were there and, it, and it's going to be them that is going to be, oh, it's already being hit uh, particularly hard because of their reliance on natural resources. Alvin, oh, you're also in charge of EFAT's um, Agriculture ASAP program, Adaptation mm -hmm. for Smallholder Agriculture. Um, how does that link to Doha and what about climate finance? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Part of the glass half full story, um, uh, as I was just saying to you, is that there's a lot of quite encouraging action going on on the ground, which is in many cases in stark contrast to a certain politics of mistrust and lack of action in the international negotiation process. So, you know, what we are finding in, in IFAD is that there is a tremendous receptivity and demand from the communities we're working with. To, to really think through what, what the climate change means for them. So what IFAD has done is set up a really ambitious new program called the Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program. And in a nutshell, this is a new window as part of our core replenishment process where governments, uh, donor countries, provided fast-track climate finance directly into IFAD for us to get to smallholder farmers. The sense we had is, or have is that smallholder farmers are not getting much of this climate finance. And if we can make them big recipients, we can make a case with really strong M&E systems. Um, we can make a strong evidence base that smallholder farmers should be really significant recipients of climate finance. Mm -hmm. Because of uh, two reasons. First, because they're on, as I said, the front line of climate change. So they're a really important people to help uh, manage climate impacts. They're affected directly by the storms, droughts, floods, extremely hot, or extremely cold days. Also, because if we do things the right way with them, a lot of the adaptation actions that we will be supporting smallholder farmers to do also are pretty good at reducing emissions. So one way or another, these 500 million smallholder farms feeding about a third of humanity just simply have got to be part of the climate story. And you ask how it related to Doha. Um, there isn't a, there isn't, basically, what, what this program is doing is taking fast-track climate finance, demonstrating how getting that to smallholder farmers is a really good thing to do, and then we hope to make the case to the Green Climate Fund, 
and other future funding sources that we should not overlook smallholder farmers. That, that's really the link, the link to mm -hmm. Doha. Just in terms of the program itself, um, we have five donors. We're extremely grateful for their support. Um, we have uh, contributions from the UK, Canada, Belgium, Sweden, uh, the Netherlands contribution is, is being finalized. Uh, we have about $250 million in, uh, in, in, uh, in firm pledges uh, and an, an additional $80 million as a conditional pledge from, from UK. And that's big enough to co-finance about a third of our future programs. So that's a very abrupt and really quite striking program of institutional change within IFAM too, to tool up to make sure that you know, at least a third of our programs are very much best practice in what is climate smart agriculture. So how does the program progress so far? It's, I mean, there's a lot of programs that, that have good ambition, they have very, very smart setups, and, but mm. you've, you've just started. Does it pick up? Does it really get there? Do you see anything already there? Yeah, we, um, it started um, basically now. Uh, we had the finalized contributions um, from uh, various donors over the last few weeks, actually. Uh, we've already uh, com uh, made one um, contribution to Mozambique, where there was a what's called a value chain project going to Mozambique of 40, about $45 million. We added $5 million from ASAP, a grant finance. So ASAP is a grant finance instrument to that program to really help uh, that, that project in Mozambique think through how do you make a climate smart value chain project. So that's already gone to our board and that will be starting to disperse very soon. Um, and then we're very, we're very quickly designing projects in a whole bunch of other countries. We started design work in Bolivia, Eritrea. Uh, Ethiopia, um, Nicaragua, Mali, Vietnam, Yemen, and we're about to start um, design work in Bangladesh, Djibouti, Liberia, and Nigeria, all with an intention of developing, on average, $10 million grants to these countries and having those grants approved by our board in the next year. We hope to approve about uh, 10 to 12 projects in the next year, worth about $116 million in total co-financing about $350 million of, uh, of, of, of if, if that operation. So the bottom line is we aim to very rapidly mobilize in this program. But one thing I do want to say is that there, there are various, I don't think I'm not aware of a program this big, that's, there isn't a program this big that's focusing on smallholder farmers and climate change adaptation. But there are a lot of programs on climate change generally, which involve lots of projects. What's important to us in, in IFAD is that this is much more than the sum of its parts. So there is quite an intensive uh, monitoring and evaluation program attached to this, all with a view to being able to make the case that yes, you know, this works. And what is this? Or well, what is building climate resilience for smallholder farmers? So we aim to describe it. We aim to measure it and we aim to communicate it. And uh, that's extremely important to us to, to do that quite quickly so that if, as is anticipated, more and more of future north-south or east-west public finance transfers, such as aid, are anchored around climate change, that this important community of smallholders isn't overlooked as they so often are because they are not the elites. They're not the power brokers. They're not the ones, particularly often with, with, with big influence in, in governments. So we really want them to be major recipients and, and essentially they're at the finance table. You say size does matter in terms of climate, climate, pro, climate related agriculture approaches. Yeah, I, I think it's important, at least institutionally, to have a critical mass. You know, if this program for IFAD had been maybe $30, $40 million, we'd have been able to do a bunch of probably smaller projects. But it's actually a third of our last replenishment about. Um, that's big enough to 
generate the kind of internal incentives and recognition of this issue that was needed to help IFAD move uh, even more rapidly in the direction of being a, a genuinely climate smart organization. And believe you me, this is a challenging task in any development organization. Mm. Climate change is not necessarily an intuitive issue. And there is still some confusion out there uh, amongst partners and even some of us here in IFAD about what's really different about climate smart agriculture. Is this simply a relabeling uh, of what we always did uh, in the sense is this old wine in new bottles? Elvin, you're very familiar with the platform. You've been involved mm -hmm. in some way or the other with the platform for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned already that there's a number of donors in the ASEP program. Do, do you see any um, particular utility in involving the uh, platform going to the next uh, platform annual general assembly? Is there any mm -hmm. particular use uh, or something that other platform members should know? You know, my feeling is, and I've spoken to a lot of country program managers and IFAD partners in agriculture and development organizations, is we need to do something to just clarify this issue. I mean, I am really struck, as I just said a moment ago, of how many good agriculturalists will come to me and say, isn't this what we always did? Isn't this a rebranding exercise because this is where the money's coming from now? And I think we've seriously got to do something to develop a conceptual framework for the issue of climate change in agriculture that makes sense to agriculturalists. It makes sense within the sector. Using the is this old wine in new bottles analogy I made, uh, I started a moment ago. The answer I tend to give is that it is maybe 80% old wine in new bottles. You know, the, 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 it, it is using tools and techniques that we've developed over many years, such as agroforestry, um, such as um, land, land restoration techniques, such as biogas, uh, you know, tremendous potential. All these techniques, and there's 30, 40, 50, hundreds of, of such techniques. But the thing was, they were often used without a consciousness around climate change. So all we're doing is adding a new grape variety that's maybe 20% of that new bottle. And that 20% and that new grape variety is stuff like climate forecasting, much more detailed vulnerability assessment, a much greater emphasis on risk management and risk management tools, a much longer term focus to the, the project or policy design so that we're thinking of within time scales of 20 years. So you can have a trend where actually temperature, average temperature increases can affect the kind of investment decisions you'd make rather than the more typical short term. I.e. we're not using the past as the guide to the future. We're using estimates of what will happen in the future. Now, if you add that 20%, it changes the taste of the whole bottle because the way in which you'd use all these tools that we've developed in the past may be quite different. You would locate your water buffers in different places. You'd do, locate your uh, small-scale irrigation sites, your water treatment uh, sites somewhere, you know, in, in a quite different way. And if I can, uh, before I turn to the question of the platform, if, you, if I may sort of expand a little on this, um, Vietnam's a really fascinating example here where um, we're developing, um, using ASAP support, a project uh, with the Vietnamese authorities in the Mekong Delta. Now, the Mekong Delta is going to be hit so hard by climate change. It, and it's so important to Vietnam's uh, production systems. It, 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 it's about a half of their agricultural production overall, and it's 80% of their rice exports. Now, Sea level rise is going to hit it. It's already inundating coasts. And one meter will inundate about three quarters of, of the arable land in the delta. The saline is going to limit rice, rice production. The temperature increases are meaning that the river flow is decreasing. So water is backing, excuse me, so water is backing up 
uh, inland and affecting salinity of, of inland, uh, of land surrounding inland waterways. The temperature increases are also affecting rice production during the flowering period, extremely sensitive period for rice. The droughts are longer, and there's longer, hotter, and summer periods. And as much as 90% of the delta will be subject to flooding. Why am I saying all this? Because a climate sensitive and aware approach to development in the delta will not just look at the seed varieties, which is an unfortunately familiar way of thinking about climate smart agriculture, as if we can somehow maintain current systems exactly as they are, but with better technologies, they'll enable those systems to survive. Well, in the Delta, that would involve finding a kind of super seed of rice that instead of withstanding a few days underwater, will withstand two weeks underwater. That will be far more saline resistant, that can withstand average higher and peak temperatures, that will be more drought resistant, and can you believe it, after all this, we'll actually have better yields to feed more people. Well, we can't just rely on that. We've got to try and work on the seed varieties, but we've also got to look at diversification of these systems and look at the whole ecosystem in the delta and think about income and land use diversification. So we're not just thinking about rice or thinking about a shrimp rice mix or, or mariculture in, in highly saline areas. Much more serious, much more profound approach to water management that goes beyond traditional water groups. We build adaptive capacity. It's a fairly long way of saying that um, when you actually mix that 20% with the 80%, you're looking at very significant farming system changes in addition to using technology to make the current system or the new system work better. And that that makes climate change and climate smart agriculture actually quite a challenging issue because it goes well beyond essentially layering a few things onto our current systems of farming. It really challenges you know, fundamental or sometimes almost ideological approaches to farming um, and is in fact many ways quite challenging to the traditional um, green revolution approach to farming, which is in as some describe it, can be a little cookie cutter and fairly focused on, on, on an input intensive way of, of managing and, and a fair, not particularly diverse way of managing, managing landscapes. So now, does it have a, quite a strong communications component if you talk about ideology and behavior change? Does it include that? You know, I think there is a, there are some very serious questions to be asked about given the mounting evidence that we are seeing about how agriculture systems, including smallholder agriculture systems, let's not forget that because of a lack of support, investment, and sometimes education, uh, smallholders are often a significant driver of land degradation and, and um, deforestation. There is, I think, some very good questions to be asked about with a growing body of evidence. Why is it that the policy framework tends to lag a little behind a little bit behind that we are seeing quite a quite a significant shift in mindsets around what is agriculture but that still doesn't feel as widespread as you you would think it would be and what's the right solution there often i've been in meetings where there is a room full of technical experts discussing how we can change mindsets, how we can change the paradigm, how we can turn climate change and agriculture from being sort of slightly tack on issues to the main business of feeding the world into really core, really core issues. Um, so we go beyond in a way a sort of lip service to these issues in, in some quarters. And uh, actually what you need in the room are communication experts and uh, the kind of skills that would um, be involved in political campaigning. But remember that Many of those involved in this issue are UN organizations, and, and, and there are limits, um, which we must respect. Um, and, and so, in a sense, our role is to uh, develop the technical understanding of the issues and to be able to share those technical understanding of the issues. Your question about the role of the global donor platform, um, 
I think there's a lot the global donor platform can play because you're bringing together many of those who are very much at the center of um, at least the donor community's engagement in agriculture. And I think there's still a lot we can do to bridge a disconnect between the agriculture and the environment and the climate stories. Uh, I think our donors are more and more putting climate putting money into climate smart agriculture as it's often described. <clears throat> I think there's a lot we can do to coordinate those efforts to try and develop a common understanding of the issues as I was discussing before so that there is a, um, a more coordinated approach. At the moment it feels a little scattered, a little disjointed. Um, I would like to see much closer cooperation between agencies and donors to, to be able to take this forward. So again, all the efforts add up to more than the sum of the parts. And I'm really hoping that at the annual general meeting in January, the session on climate change, where it will be myself, Gordon Conway, and some others discussing, having a very active and informal discussion in the room, can think a lot more about this. I uh, think a lot more about how we can try and rejuvenate uh, the network that was active in the past uh, and still doing some activity around climate change and think about what it means in terms of the core the core understanding of agriculture too. Thank you very much. I'm sure that the platform members at the AGA are looking forward to hearing some of the concrete approaches what you suggest to how to join hands to coordinate. Good. Thank you. Okay. I look forward to seeing you in January.